So I would like to begin uh, tonight by acknowledging the Shoshone, the Goshoot, and the Ute peoples, uh, the traditional inhabitants of this land, and on whose homelands we are meeting this week. So as a scholar, I'm interested in researching and writing about both the natural science of botanical knowledge held by indigenous peoples and their religious practices and traditions. It is at this intersection of natural science and religion where I believe that indigenous peoples have a distinct understanding of the natural world. It is what some call traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous science. I spent the last year at the Harvard Divinity School as a research associate and visiting professor where I worked on my third book project tentatively titled Plants That Purify the Natural and Supernatural History of Smudging. Thanks. I was at Harvard in November when Hillary Clinton won the popular vote but lost the national election. On campus, it was a shock of epic proportions. It was unbelievable. The next day, Harvard began public discussions around what the role of scholars and scientists would be in this new administration and what voices would be heard or would be silenced. And that is what I want us to think about today. However, let me briefly remind everyone of our collective United States history. Native Americans did not become citizens of the United States until 1924 with the passage of the American Indian Citizenship Act. We're not provided protections to practice our own religions or to speak our own languages until 1978 with the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act and 1990 with the passage of the Native American Languages Act. I state these facts because I want to remind everyone that Native Americans did not come to America. But America, as a colonizing power, came to them. All four of my grandparents, although they were born in the state of Montana, were not born US citizens. They all grew up speaking their own native languages. They practiced their own native religions and cultural traditions. I want to mention this because I think, unfortunately, in the US today, we tend to believe that citizenship and speaking English provide individuals their only voice and their only reason to be heard. I don't think that's true. But. I grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana and throughout the Pacific Northwest. I spent a significant time at my grandparents' home. My grandmother learned to speak English at Catholic boarding school, which for her was mostly a good experience. But she also remembered every single person who turned her in for speaking Blackfeet until the day she died. I was fortunate to apprentice with my grandmother learning about the ethnobotany and traditional ecological knowledge of the Blackfeet. It was from my grandmother and my great aunts that I first learned about science. My grandmother was a scientist and a doctor, although she would not use those English words to describe herself. She had a deep knowledge of plants, lichen, fungi, soils, riparian areas, and weather patterns. She had learned about medicine and the natural world from her grandmother and her great-grandmother. She showed me how, for instance, to hold soil in my hand, breathe in deeply to be able to gauge the amount of tannin that would be held in the roots of a medicinal plant. As she grew older, she encouraged me to write down her stories and her knowledge about medicinal plant use. 
She recognized that for future generations to learn about Blackfeet traditional knowledge and for her voice to be heard, it would be through the written word and it would be in English. The day after Trump's, uh, Trump's inauguration, millions participated in the Women's March on DC and nationwide. At that same time, a discussion began on social media about a march for science. Within hours, thousands of people, then tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands wanted to act, and so did I. From January to April, hundreds of scientists, science advocates, and allies worked tirelessly to not only organize a march in DC, but also in satellite cities worldwide. It was the largest day of science advocacy in world history, with over one million participants in over 600 cities. SACNIS, as many of you know, was one of the first founding partners for the March for Science. I joined the March for Science for two reasons. One was because of what I saw as an assault on science, especially as it impacted tribal communities. For example, the failure to conduct a complete environmental impact statement by scientists at Standing Rock. And second, because of, I wanted to make sure that indigenous voices would be heard. Indigenous scientists had to be at the table. As the saying goes, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. Very early on, I called Robin Kimmerer, a well-known Potawatomi botanist, to talk about doing something at the March for Science to lift up indigenous voices. Amazingly, she was thinking the same thing. We started that day to write an indigenous science statement and we contacted two other indigenous scholars of ecology and environment, Melissa Nelson and Kyle White. Our efforts were old school. After dozens of emails and conference calls, we even used a fax machine to contact people. We finally had a version for people to sign. Within about a day, over a thousand indigenous scientists and allies signed on to our statement which was read from Sydney, Australia, all the way around the world to Washington, D.C. at the Washington, D.C. rally. So the indigenous science statement we wrote said, as we endorse and support the March for Science, let us acknowledge that there are multiple ways of knowing that play an essential role in advancing knowledge for the health of all life. Science as concept and process is translatable into over 500 different indigenous languages in the US and thousands worldwide. Western science is a powerful approach, but it is not the only one. Indigenous science provides a wealth of knowledge and a powerful alternative paradigm by which we understand the natural world and our relation to it. So, not everybody supported the indigenous science statement. There was a lot of pushback from mainstream scientists against recognizing indigenous ways of knowing. But I have learned from my previous activism that this is just par for the course. In my advocacy for indigenous language, languages, I have often spoke with members of Congress and US senators. Once a senator challenged me about using indigenous languages as a medium of instruction in schools. He questioned, how can children learn science in indigenous language without using English? I answered to him, Senator, 250 million children in China learn about science without using the English language. And I told him, I think children here in the United States can learn science using their own indigenous languages. So, <laughs> he smiled 
after I said that, and he got it. And he has been one of our main uh, supporters for Indigenous language um, funding. And actually, this particular senator, who's Republican, um, just helped us add another $2 million in the appropriations bill for Indigenous languages. So as we all know, in the past year, civil discourse in the United States has become difficult. It is not always easy to stand up and speak out, to speak out individually or to collectively among millions. So I want to end today by encouraging everybody to use your voice to stand up for science, which I believe is under threat, but also to use your voice to stand up for our grandmothers, for those who were not born in the, as US citizens, for those who don't want to use the English language, for those who are doctors but without a degree. We need to let their voices be heard. Thank you.